We'll dismiss the children at this time for Children's Church. While the rest of you are turning to Matthew chapter 6. We're glad that all of you are here today. I see some family members have come in from with us today, and that's great. I want to continue in the Sermon on the Mount today from Matthew chapter 6. I'm really getting a, a lot out of this uh, study of the Sermon on the Mount. The words of Jesus are just so deep and so profound and so practical and so applicable to the world in which we live. They're timeless words. And uh, I think you'll find today's message to be no exception. I don't, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. You don't have to raise your hand today, but I wonder how many here today are prone to worry. Don't tell me. That's all right. Just think about it. Prone to worry. I hear a lot of Christians just flat out say, I'm worried. And uh, the Bible says, don't do that. Don't worry. Well, I'm not really worried. I'm just concerned. Uh, I'm not really worried. I'm just planning ahead. Well, there's, there's some truth to that. There is a difference in worry and concern. And uh, we should plan. The Bible teaches us to plan. But worry is a negative, harmful, destructive uh, emotion more akin to anxiety and fear. That's what we're going to be addressing today. Um, it's easy, maybe even natural, to worry. Most of us probably have a, at least some fear of the unknown. The future is unknown. There's a certain amount of uncertainty, perhaps even anxiety, about what the future might hold, especially in these times in which we live. Supply chain, unemployment. I went to the gas pump this week and paid twice what I used to pay to fill my car, almost $60. These are odd times, they're different times, they're sometimes perilous times, so we might be tempted to be concerned. Maybe not for ourselves, but for our children and their children. And yet, one of those challenging commands of Jesus is found in our text today when he said, do not worry. Today we're going to explore the topic of worry and a possible connection between our priorities, what we value, and our tendency to worry. There's a connection there. And our text is Matthew 6, beginning with verse 31. Jesus starts with the word, so. And that indicates that what he is about to say is connected to what he has just said. He said, so do not worry, saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For pagans run after, pursue, prioritize all those things. Your heavenly Father knows you need them. There's nothing wrong with food and drink and clothing and all those things. God knows we need them. But he's about to contrast and give us another option, something that we can do instead of worry. He says, seek first. First in order of sequence and in order of importance. Seek first his kingdom. Prioritize his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Each day has enough, but not too much, trouble of its own. Smart people have said that no one ever cracked under the pressure of one day. Each day has enough, but not too much, pressure. It's when we worry and we drag tomorrow's stress into today and we regret and we bring past stress into today 
that we get into trouble. God knew what he was doing when he divided life into 24-hour compartments. There's nothing that can come your way today that you and God can't handle. So don't worry. Seek his kingdom. Each day has enough trouble of its own without dragging other days in on top of it. So let me read all of that without all my extra commentary. <laughs> so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That's some of the best advice you'll ever hear. As I said, Jesus linked this passage to the previous verses with the word so. And he went on to say, therefore, indicating that this heavenly mindset will allow us to put things in proper perspective. That's the key, so that we don't have to worry. So let's look back. Let's backtrack just a little bit to verse 19 and see what Jesus had just said that he was linking this to. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Wherever you invest your time, your intention, your affection, wherever you invest, that's where your heart's going to be. Think about that. We probably need to be intentional about our investment of time, energy, affection, because wherever we invest, our heart will follow. Wherever your heart is, your treasure will follow. So these verses speak of a heavenly treasure. Jesus warned believers against setting their heart on earthly things because they don't last. They can be taken in an instant. Flood, tornado, fire, stock market crash, thieves, whatever. Things that are tangible, things of this earth can be taken. We're not called to trust in things or possessions. We're called to trust in God. Now, treasures, earthly treasures are easy to identify. They're tangible. They're things that we can touch. Worldly possessions, money, material things. That's easy. Don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth. But what's he talking about when he says lay up treasures in heaven? How do we send it on ahead? How do we invest in that heavenly kingdom? Jesus told the rich man in Mark 10, 21, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. I don't think that all of us have to literally go and sell everything that we have, but Jesus saw into this young man's heart. If you'll recall, he was a very religious man, a very good man. He had, done, he had followed the law, but Jesus knew what his one problem was. He was materialistic. And he put faith and trust in material things. So Jesus pierced right through to the heart of the matter and uh, told him what he needed to do. He needed to take his hands off of that stuff. In 1 Timothy 6, 17, Paul told Timothy, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, I like that phrase, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they'll lay up treasures. There we go, there's how we do it. There's how we lay up treasure in heaven. We are rich in good deeds, we are generous. Storing up treasures in heaven is about obedience to God in all areas of life, but especially in our generosity in our good deeds, the way that we treat people. Someone said the only things we keep are the things we give away. You see, there's so many things in the Christian life that are paradoxical. They are opposite of the way the world thinks. 
The only things we keep are the things that we give away. The things that we cling to so tightly will be taken from us one of these days. We'll leave it all behind. But the things we give away will keep, and they accrue to our heavenly bank accounts. Jesus identified a very significant principle in, in uh, chapter 6, verse 21, one that we should always remember. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He wasn't so much concerned with their wealth as he was their loyalty. The danger of amassing possessions is that they tend to attract our loyalty. Jesus recognized that the things we treasure will inevitably occupy our hearts and slowly control the direction of our lives and our values and our choices and our decisions. We should intentionally invest in things of eternal value. It may be something that you have to do purposely. It may not be natural at first. But if you realize that something is of eternal value, you need to purposely and intentionally invest in that thing. When I'm trying to make a decision, it's easy to make a decision between good and bad. That's obvious. But what about good and better? How do we determine what is best? I ask myself, will this matter a hundred years from now, a thousand years, a million years? Does this have any really eternal significance? That's something that we need to ask ourselves regularly. We, I've been to a lot of funerals lately. I've been around a lot of death lately. And one of the things about those last days is that all of a sudden, everything becomes crystal clear. It's, it's obvious what is important and what is not when you come to the end. Relationships are important. Family is important. Friends are important. And of course, the most important of all is our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Those are the things that are important. Material things, we leave it all behind. Someone else has to deal with it. So we need to intentionally invest our time, energy, money, whatever it is, in things of eternal value. That's how we lay up treasure in heaven. But then Jesus goes on to talk about singleness of purpose. We look over in the book of James and it says a double-minded man or a woman is unstable. When you don't have a single priority in life, it's difficult to make proper decisions. It's difficult to keep first things first if you don't know what the first thing is. Singleness of purpose. He goes on in there, uh, verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. If your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? You know, it's not so much the darkness out there that's dangerous. It's the darkness in here and in here. Jesus use a, uses an exclamation point there when he says, if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. I don't like the idea of listing priorities in numerical order. I've got God first, I've got family second, I've got church. I like the idea of just having one priority. God, his will, his kingdom, everything God. That's my priority. Everything else in life derives its importance as to how it relates to that one priority. Singleness of purpose. Jesus called his followers to be undivided in their loyalty and their allegiance. No competing priorities. You may have heard the name Luciano Pavarotti. He was uh, perhaps the most famous tenor who ever lived. He 
he began to study music as a young boy. He also enrolled in a teacher's college. After graduating from college, he asked his father, shall I be a teacher or a singer? His father replied, if you try to sit in two chairs, you'll fall between them. You must, want, you must choose one chair. Pavarotti chose singing, and the rest is history. He later said, whether it's laying bricks, writing a book, whatever you choose, give yourself to it. Commitment is the key. Choose one chair. Choose one priority. As for me and my house, We'll serve the Lord. That's our priority. Does this mean we can't do more than one thing? I, I hope not. For most of my career, I've been what they call a bivocational pastor. For most of my life, I've had at least two jobs, sometimes three. So I hope it doesn't mean that you can only do one thing, but what it does mean is that you can only have one master. Jesus will not share the throne. He must be Lord and Master of our lives. He went on to give two examples. First is the I. Our I determines our perception. It determines how we see things. If the eyes are healthy and good, we'll be full of light. If they're unhealthy, we'll be full of darkness. The Greek word there for good means singular, complete, or perfect. I hate having dirty glasses. Does anybody wear glasses? Don't you hate having dirty glasses? When you've got, when you've got dirty glasses, everything's dirty. Everything you see is dirty. I mean, it's just cloudy. It's I told you when I was out mowing one day, I thought it was overcast and I better get done before the Rain came and I took my glasses off and it was a bright sunshiny day. <laughs> my glass had, glasses had turned dark and I was seeing everything in a dark way. The eye is the lamp of the body. Our physical and our spiritual eyes determine how we perceive the world. And if our eyes are dark, then the world is dark. He talks about singular, complete, or perfect vision that results in generosity. If the eye is unhealthy, if it's divided, if we have double vision, then we'll be full of darkness, which often results in selfishness and greed. The direction a person takes is determined by the focus of the eyes. If you don't believe it, just ask Charlene about my driving. Oh, look at that cow over there in that field. <laughs> <laughs> I go where I'm looking. Before I know it, I'm hearing rumble strips. But that's the way, I mean, that's a humorous example, but that's the way our lives work. If you expect darkness and doom and gloom, if you're paranoid, if you think everybody's out to get you, those are the kinds of results that you'll get from life. The eye, the way we see things, our perception, our perspective, where we're coming from determines what we see. When the eye is singular and focused on God, then the person will walk clearly in the light. When it's divided and unfocused, the person will wander without direction in darkness. I was driving down the road the other day and this really nice Mazda came by. I'm doing like this and I hit something in the road. I looked back, it looked like a sack of concrete. It was, it was a big deal. I thought I'd surely destroyed something, but I didn't. That's what happens when you're not focused, when you're not looking where you're going. We need to walk in the light. We need to walk in the way that God has illuminated for us. This is the way, walk ye in it. We'll never be sorry. 
Jesus was explaining that those with bad eyes, those who walk in darkness, might think they have light. And this darkness is more tragic, even worse, because they fail to realize the darkness in which they live. If the darkness is within you, how great is that darkness? It's one thing to walk in darkness and know it. It's another thing to walk in darkness and think it's light. Many today have exchanged the light for darkness. Many of them willfully. They've come across the light and they've rejected the light and they've intentionally and willfully embraced the darkness. They call evil good and good evil. How terrible it is to mistake darkness for light and light for darkness. The second example that Jesus gave was the idea of a single master. He says, no one can serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. That word for money refers to property, wealth. King James, I think, calls it mammon. It means material things. It derives from a word that means that in which one trusts. Now you say, no one can serve two masters. What do you mean? I've got two jobs. I, this is my main job, and this is my side job. My moonlight over here. Is there anything wrong with that? He didn't say you can't serve two employers. He said you can't serve two masters. You see, the image is a slave owner. You cannot be a slave to this person and a slave to that person because sooner or later they're going to come in conflict and your allegiance is going to be divided. You cannot be a slave to two masters. You've got to choose, and that's what Jesus is saying. You cannot possibly serve in the way that I'm talking about serving two masters. Now, probably most of us have tried at one point in our lives. I don't know if you ever went through a period in your Christian life when you were trying to uh, live with one foot in the world and one foot in the church, trying to serve two masters. You wanted to make it, make it to heaven. You wanted a Savior. But this idea of having a Lord, that wasn't all that attractive. You kind of still wanted to call your own shots. You kind of wanted to do things your way. And you're kind of like that situation that Paul described in Romans 7. You wanted to do good, but when you tried to do good, then evil was present with you. And you did the things you didn't want to do, and you didn't do the things you did want to do. And who's going to deliver me from this life, this double-minded way of living? Who's going to do it? He says, praise be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You don't have to live that way. You cannot do it indefinitely. When I think of trying to serve two masters, I think of having one foot on the dock and one foot in the boat. You got the image? That boat drifts gradually away from the dock and you come to a point of no return. It's time to choose. Jesus says you can't do both. So far, Jesus has contrasted two storehouses. Where are you going to invest? Two visions. Light or darkness. Where will you focus? And two masters. Who are you going to serve? You're going to serve one or the other. And this brings us to our last topic, worry and anxiety. That's why in verse 25 he said, therefore. In light of what he had just said, he could now say, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, your body, what you'll wear. Is life not more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds. I have a window outside my bathroom and there's a walnut tree outside that window. And I just enjoy sitting, watching the birds sitting out there on the limb. And I've never seen one that looked the least bit stressed. Now, granted, I wouldn't know what a stressed bird looks like, <laughs> but they certainly didn't seem stressed, chirping and fluttering and all the things that birds do. He says, consider the birds. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. 
Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? That's a rhetorical question. And the answer, of course, is no one. Worry doesn't accomplish anything. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So don't worry. Saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first His kingdom, His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You see, Jesus called His followers to a singleness of devotion and obedience. One of the obstacles in trusting God's way and God's will for our lives is the distraction of worry and anxiety. So he said, don't worry. <laughs> Easier said than done, right? I'm fortunate enough that I, I'm not prone to worry. Um, but some of you are. It's, it's, it's not good or bad. It's just a natural personality trait, and you tend toward it. So maybe you have to fight it a little bit harder. True disciples should not be distracted by the cares of this life. Remember the eye? When you're worrying, where's your focus? It's not on the solution, it's on the problem. When you're worrying, you're thinking about the cares of this life. You're focusing on your problems rather than your solution. God can be trusted, period. Trust is the antidote to worry. You can't trust when you're worrying. You can't worry when you're trusting. Now this doesn't mean that Christians should not work, save money, or plan ahead. How many people have you known that uh, they've been employed for years and they're just trusting God? I, that's not what it's saying. It does mean that believers should not be overly fretful and distracted by earthly necessities, which probably aren't necessities at all. Worry achieves nothing. It's like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Jesus asked that rhetorical question, who, can, who by worrying can add a single hour? Nobody. Jesus provided two examples, birds and flowers. Like I said, it's not an excuse for laziness. I watch those squirrels out there gathering those walnuts. They're working pretty hard. They're storing up. It's not an excuse for laziness, but it is an admonition to trust. Jesus provided the remedy for worry. Seek his kingdom. His righteousness, put your focus on Him, put your focus on His will. Look to the solution, not the problem. Replace worry with positive attitude and action. When we actively seek God's kingdom and His righteousness as our priority, worry and anxiety can't get a foothold. When we put first things first, God can be trusted to take care of the rest. Three greatest obstacles to holy living, a divided heart, materialism, and worry. Jesus calls us to singleness of allegiance and focus on God. Now the world offers lots of attractions, distractions. The world reminds me so much of a carnival. I walk down the midway at the carnival and they've got all these bright, bright colors and flashy lights and people calling at you, winners, you know, everybody's a winner, you know, and all that kind of stuff. That's so much like the world. The devil puts the best he has to offer right up front, trying to lure us in. The world offers flimsy prizes, false promises, but the only path that leads to true peace, a single treasure, a single vision, a single master, free of the burden of worry 
is a life lived for God. Shall we stand? Heads bowed and eyes closed, please. I wonder if there is anyone here today that by uplifted hand would say that uh, I struggle in these areas. Uh, I see some hands. I've ha I, I see lots of hands. I think we all do at one time or another. I'll, let's all pray for each other that we keep our focus where it needs to be, keep our trust where it needs to be, and quit trusting in flimsy substitutes. Father, we thank you for these that have been honest today and admitted that uh, they struggle in some of these areas. I think we all do from time to time. And this is such timeless, such wise, practical advice that you've given here in the most famous sermon ever given. We just pray, Lord, that you'd drive it home. Help us to realize the truth in what you've said. Help us to keep our focus and our trust in you, realizing that everything else will fall into place. Thank you for these that have come out today. We pray that you'd bless them for it. Pray that you'd bless those who are in special need physically, these that have lost loved ones financially, relationally, whatever the needs are, Lord, we just pray that you'd minister according to your perfect will. We'll give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.